Hey, space fans. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Doris Urrutia, and I'm here with Neil deGrasse Tyson. We are going to be talking about the new season, well, not season, this new chapter of Cosmos, Possible Worlds. Um, why, so I've checked out some of the episodes, and... Um, but I, camera, it sounds like you've seen all of them, because <laughs> you had just <laughs> flew into back and forth. Uh, well, oh yeah, I mean, I have seen, uh, I have seen quite a few of the episodes. Mm -hmm. um, I was really mesmerized by the way that the score has played with, for example, some footage of Cassini. I love the Cassini episode. Um, is some of this footage new? So, <clears throat> Cassini just... For those, I mean, you have a highly space literate audience, but just in case, uh, Cassini was our mission, our NASA and Europe's mission to Saturn, and it was there for more than a dozen years in orbit, getting really good data. And then it was time to end the mission. Do you leave it perpetually in orbit or, or not? Mm -hmm. And there are other places we want to explore among Saturn's moons and there is Cassini, something that came from Earth. And one of our worries was that if, it just, we, if we just left it there to die and we can't control it, it might go into an unstable orbit and crash into one of the moons that we have some hope and expectation could harbor life. So if you have a, a human-made craft contaminating a moon that might have life one day, that's not, a, that's not wise. It's not wise space travel not why space exploration. So you do the honorable thing and you put it in a self-destruct orbit where it falls into Saturn itself. And at the speeds it's traveling, the moment it starts hitting the atmosphere, the heat it will just vaporize and that will kill any microorganisms that might have lingered since it had been launched from Earth. It just gets it out of the picture and they get returned to atoms in Saturn's atmosphere. So um, some of those um, so we have our own visual effects supervisor that adds images and content, but some of the, 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 the meat of that view was a, a video that was released by the Jet Propulsion Labs a few years ago that, that shared with the world the death of Saturn. And it was sad because there are people who, scientists and, and engineers who were there from the beginning, and, and you bring it to life and then you see it get launched and then you wait it out till it gets to its destination, and then you collect the data, and then you actually euthanize it. What was the editorial decision about? Because when, uh, in the weeks leading up to uh, Cassini's ultimate demise, and like you mentioned, it was sent on this sort of final journey, and it, it ended up having to do uh, several pirouettes around Saturn, and it finally ended with this. So people knew it was going to be happening uh, within, you know, people knew it was going to be uh, the mission was going to be ending. Um, but there were some folks at NASA who were a little more stringent about not personalizing the mission, the spacecraft. I leaned more into sort of dramatizing it because it did mean a lot for a lot of people. And I, that's what Cosmos ended up doing. Did you have uh, sort of like an editorial debate about how you should sort of, like trying to personify yeah, the mission of it? That's a really important philosophical, cultural, and scientific question. Uh, the insights that I have on that, that I'm about to share with you, uh, came about from an episode of Star Talk, which is another thing that I host. It's a podcast. Uh, we recently had an episode, but it might not be out yet, but I recently uh, interviewed a robotics ethicist. And what she said was that it is very natural where if you have any kind of relationship with a thing at all, whether or not it's even living, that you would assign a personality to it, as a minimum a name, a name. And we do that with, with, with plush toys from childhood. They're not alive, but we give them names. We name, well, I don't, haven't heard much of it lately, but when I grew up, everybody named their car. Okay, they spoke of it as though, and if the car wasn't working, oh, she's not feeling good today, we gotta give her oil change or whatever. So this is a very normal and natural and human thing to do. Apparently, I didn't know this, 80% of the people who own Roombas name their Roomba, the, the Roomba, 
you know, the, 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 uh -huh. the okay. yeah, 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 no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I call My it Roomba. The one. Roomba, yeah. <laughs> Eighty percent of them name their Roomba, and that's not even that's not even Androidal, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, to stand in denial of this urge, I think is is removing an important human feeling, a human dimension of what it is to do science. Because what is a science is a human activity. Yeah, in the end, there's this dispassionate result, but the person doing it is feeling it. The person doing it has emotions about it. And so many of the stories we tell capture those emotions. And you see, you know, scientists welling up who are watching this demise. That's real. So, so no, there was no debate about whether we embrace um, the emotional dimension of scientific discovery and scientific experiments. It was all in from the beginning. I also noticed that when you do the, when the show does the vignettes about the, uh, the different scientists that have played a role in, say, the theme of an episode. Yeah, the historical. Uh, yeah, the animations. Mm -hmm. um, there is, I think, a little more sensitivity this time around with how the scientist is contextualized in terms of like what they went through and sort of what, you know, what what an oppressive government could do to an individual. Um, and I wonder if that was sort of, um, if that was, like what that conversation was also like when you think about which scientists you include, but also how you choose to tell their stories. What's, what are you all thinking about when you develop that narrative? Yeah, so Andrian is the prime mover of these stories. She has a, an acute sense and awareness of history, especially history of science. That's a good background to have in this. Uh, she also feels the universe. When she thinks about it, she not only knows what is true, she s recognizes what our relationship to that should be, if it not already is. That is your intellectual and emotional relationship. So this, this manifests in many ways. For example, are we separate and distinct from all other life on Earth? Well, if that's the case, then we can kill biospheres and ecosystems at will, but then realize, wait a minute, we needed that to survive because, in fact, we were co-participants in this biosphere, right? That, that's profound. That says we are not separate and distinct. We are part of an unfolding cosmic story. So with regard to historical figures that basically were science martyrs, um, it wasn't simply that there was, in one of the stories uh, we speak of Vavilov, who was a botanist biologist um, who understood plant breeding and crops. And, and th that understanding, which was the correct understanding, was not embraced by the prevailing uh, Russian go uh, government and powers. And so they just simply didn't listen. And they wanted to get him into the fray, and he refused. He said, you can burn me at the stake, I'm paraphrasing, but I will not lie about my science. That's a martyr. And the issue here is not simply as a repressive gov government, it's anything that has dogmatic views of the world, where conversation is not even allowed that would show that there's something flawed in that reasoning. That has thwarted the progress of science ever since there's been science. And so that example happens to show it for a government forces, but it could be cultural, it could be religious, it could be um, um, emotional, it could be anything that stands in the way of the progress of the discovery of objective truths. And Cosmos does not pull back when such a story can and should be told. Well, the show is really great. Um, thank you so much for speaking to space.com and space fans. Please check out Cosmos Possible Worlds when it airs.